What the? Hey, that wasn't funny. <laughs> oh well, I thought so. Right. Anyway, if you haven't seen the first part of the review, click this annotation now to be taken there. And now it's gone. Wanna get going? Yes, after you, Mr. Geek. So, after Simmer insults Pinky's party decor, Pinky shows her that Twilight has signed up and is running against her for prom queen. After hearing about this, she goes to confront her and Spike in a poorly lit hallway. How did she even know it was Twilight? We can see it's just a scribble on the paper, and it could have been any new girl. It was rather presumptuous of her to think it was Twilight, though it was pretty obvious that Celestia would send her through after the crown. She even says that she's surprised that she didn't recognize her earlier, a line that really baffles the hell out of me. It's so obviously Twilight, but we really don't have time to arm that thought for long. Seriously, that's an ongoing theme for this film. After Twilight and Simmer have a little verbal scuffle, Simmer sends Snips and Snails to follow Twilight into the library and record everything she does. But then, we suddenly get more fan pandering. Congratulations, Sweebel. You just been promoted to a vending machine. I don't know why, but there's something oddly satisfying about it being Trixie that gets the peanut butter crackers from the machine. Like, somehow, it makes sense for her and only her to do it. can quite place a finger on it though. No one really can, Critic. I find it so fitting as well, but... Hmm. So, after that second healthy helping of fan pandering, Twilight hits the library and begins to do research on the way humans act. However, to me, this is where the film's running gag comes to a halt. YouTube makes a small cameo. If not YouTube, then some kind of video streaming website. I mean, looking at the logo... It certainly looks like YouTube, and their interface is clunky and confusing, so yes, it's definitely YouTube. Oh great, they even sprinkle in some modern internet insults too. So, I guess after Twilight gets some research in, the library begins to close. But that's fine, because Spike may have been entirely out of the books off-screen for Twilight to sleep on. You would think that someone would come up into the library before shutting the doors, and tell Twilight to get out. But nope, not even a janitor comes up there to clean the upper level. I guess it's the forbidden section. No pony is meant to go there, so no pony checks. So she goes to sleep in the library and wakes up the next day, making a list of things she could talk about. But it really doesn't seem to matter, as the students begin chuckling at her as she walks through the hallway. And the snickering halts though, as she's pulled into the other room by Rarity, who is quite possibly the palest looking human that I've ever had the pleasure to lay eyes upon. And unsurprisingly, she's the pony with the most aesthetically pleasing design as a human. Other than the obvious choice of a certain pink and yellow pony, of course. What? Still, when I say she's pale, I mean that she's pure white pale. Anyways, after Twilight has a rather awkward first encounter with a human rarity, the other three of the main six that we've seen already come into the room. They then proceed to answer to Twilight's uneasiness about why people are suddenly giving her weird looks and chuckles. The answer? VIRAL VIDEOS! There was apparently nothing better for Sunset Shimmer to try than posting a poorly edited video on the internet. How utterly typical. Anyways, after Twilight and Co see the video, the other four characters begin going into a scuffle with each other, prompting Twilight to have the appropriate reaction. She acts as the voice of reason of the group when Applejack fails, and gets sucked into the fighting. She hypothesizes that Sunset is the one who tore them all apart. So, the characters explain their situations more through texts and emails they got. Probably the one that stands out the most is Applejack's base sale, which was ruined when Rainbow Dash didn't show up. The more we go through this whole fractured friendship situation, the more I'm starting to feel as though it's just an annoying contrived situation, just so Twilight would have something else to do in this world. We'll get more into these forced conflicts later. We then cut to- Whoa. Um, many Applejack is inspired to go sort things out with Rainbow Dash and we get- Wait, it's all off screen? What the hell do you want me to do? Just wait 10 seconds and the whole conflict gets resolved? Well, f well fuck you too then. I wouldn't mind waiting around for a bit. Um, what? Oh, um, anyways, after Applejack sorts things out with my waifu- I mean, Rainbow Dash, she tells Twilight about what happened on Dashie's end. Dash says that she'll help Twilight win the prom but will only do so if she beats her in a game of one-on-one -on -one soccer. But, as would be expected, Rainbow Dash wins, and she provides the only one meaningful line of dialogue even slightly comprehensible as a lesson in the whole movie. And it's weird coming from Rainbow Dash, as she's not always the most morally sound pony in town, if you know what I'm saying. Anyways, after Dash accepts to help Twilight, 
even after she lost, the group heads over to this world's equivalent of Sugar Cube Quarter to talk about a plan. But this also makes room for one thing this film didn't need. A love story. Basically, Twilight begins to grow feelings for this dude named Flash Sentry after sharing a few lines of dialogue. But here's a little fact. But Twilight only began liking him after seeing his human version. This pretty much means that all human on Pony Rule 34 is now canon. Oh god, Hasbro, think of the children. Oh. Anyway, Rarity thinks it's a good idea to instigate a furry convention in the cafeteria of a high school. You know, for kids! Well, the others must be a big fan of cosplaying as well, because they all go along with the idea without hesitation. Then we pretty much get Hasbro's take on High School Musical. No, I've gotta say this one song beats any musical numbers those films have by a landslide. This song stands out as a turning point for Twilight's campaign for Fall Formal Princess. It teaches a good lesson that we're all the same, no matter which group or background we're from. Also, if you're observant enough, you'll notice that in the bottom right corner of one of the scenes, there's the Voohey Prince making a little appearance. This song is also where most of the fan pandering stands out like a sore thumb. There's probably one or two more scenes that beat this by a hair, and spoiler warning, there are songs as well. Bass. Hmm? Bass. Wait a minute, what? Flash Sentry. He sounds as though he's playing a guitar, an electric guitar, but you can clearly see by the number of strings on it that it really is a bass guitar. Wait, wouldn't that mean Flash is a phony? Something like that. So, as our phony guitarist keeps the song going, we cut the snips and snails, who have also gotten in on the furry craze. And as always, Sunset has a new plan to stop Twilight from getting the crown. Sunset passes our heroes in the hallway with a smug look on her face. It turns out our resident mega bitch ordered snips and snails to destroy the hall, and Sunset is grafted some pictures of Twilight playing football onto them to incriminate her. She was able to put some kind of video together to embarrass Twilight, which was clearly done on some kind of computer. But she couldn't even use Photoshop to create some false photos. But don't worry, thanks to Sonic here McGee over here, that conflict is resolved in a matter of two minutes. Even less. This conflict probably would have worked out better if the movie was longer. Maybe another song would have helped create an atmosphere of sadness. Then once Twilight feels like all hope is lost, then the conflict is resolved and everything is a-okay. It really could have been, but one of the major flaws for this film is the writing. Every now and again, it can be just downright lazy or rushed. And I personally think it stands out most with Sunshit's character. The premise of it was so good, but it was poorly executed as a typical high school mega bitch trope. And, actually, a point I'd like to bring up. An idea, if you will. What if Trixie was the villain of this movie? Wait, what do you mean? Think about it. It would call back to a long line grudge between the two characters. In Ghostbusters, she was completely humiliated. In Magic Duel, again, she was overthrown by Twilight Sparkle. Not once, but twice. A hatred like that just doesn't go away completely. She was cast out into the dirt and Twilight was regarded as a hero. A legend. One of the elements of harmony. So would it really be so ridiculous to have her as a villain? It would solve a whole bunch of the movie's inconsistencies. Like, how did Sunset Shimmer know about the crown? How did she know Twilight was Celestia's student? Why are Snips and Snails following her around and doing their deeds instead of Trixie? Trixie was already in Equestria, so she would have had prior knowledge about Twilight's ascension to Princess. She would have gotten jealous and stolen her crown. Simple as that. It was actually said by Lauren Faust that she intended for Trixie to have gone to Celestia's school for gifted unicorns. Right, I get. And Sunshit Simmer was in the human world, and she would have been completely oblivious as to such event. So she wouldn't have had any motive to steal Twilight's crown. So, after Twilight gets acquitted of the crimes and one of the most sorry excuses for a plot point in history, she heads on over to Verity's Boutique, where it's made clear that the friends here are just like the ones back in Equestria. And like Spike said, they all rallied around Twilight because they saw that her intentions were nothing but pure. This scene to me is complete crap. Nobody would be fine with finding out that their newest friend was a pony princess from an alternate dimension. Moreover, why the hell did they believe her? Are they dumb? Are they all high? Has it been proven that all beings equestria or otherwise but all possess some kind of inbuilt instinctual personality disorder? Well, I don't know. So, the group goes back to the school and leads the effort in cleaning up the hall so that the prom can commence and Twilight can get her crown back. And I wasn't kidding when I said that songs were a major part of this movie, as there's another addition to this film's superb soundtrack of masterful music. So, after this, there's a lately interesting montage of the girls getting ready, which I'm about 95.8% sure that everyone who ever watched this movie in the Borny fandom ever skipped over because it reinforces the movie's girly structure. Yeah, and after the- what? For the purposes of dramatics, and my own personal choice, 
The second part is going to end here. So if you want to watch the final part, go to this annotation on the screen right here when the final part is up. So, mixed bag finale. Click here. Blah.